Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Whatever time you may be watching this particular telecast, we just want to thank you so much for joining us uh, for this particular session. Uh, by God's grace, we've been going over very many powerful truths. Uh, we have had uh, three parts so far, and this particular session that we're going to go through is just going to be building upon the foundation that by God's grace we have been able to lay. And so without further ado, I'm going to have a word of prayer that God's Holy Spirit may be with us. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this time and opportunity to be able to come back together, to be able to study your sacred and holy word. I pray in a very special way that your Holy Spirit may please be with my heart and my mind. Lord, everything that you have to communicate during this particular time, I pray that it, be, that it may be communicated in a very simple yet uh, earnest manner. I pray that you would please be with all those that are going to watch this. Uh, now and in the future, we pray that your Holy Spirit and that your blessing may rest upon them, that we may all be equipped both spiritually and practically for the times in which we are currently living. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, in light of that, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 14. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 14. By God's grace, we've been able to lay a very solid foundation as it pertains to the principles contained in Revelation 14, we have talked about the beginnings of this uh, 1844 movement. We saw that in on October 22nd, 1844, that Jesus moved from the holy into the most holy place. And we saw also in Revelation chapter 14 in our last session that though this uh, Revelation 14 is referring to the judgment of the dead, its primary application refers to the judgment of of the living. Now we also found out some of the mechanisms that Satan is using in order to bring about this state of affairs upon the planet. We also saw in Revelation chapter 13 that the two leading powers in the world today, the United States and the Roman Catholic institution, we saw that that, that those two powers are going to use their influence in order to bring a state of despotism upon this planet that the world has never seen. The Bible describes it in Daniel chapter 12 as a time of trouble such as never was. Now, in light of that, what we want to do during this particular session, we want to understand in some of its detail, some of the idiosyncrasies that Satan is going to use in order to bring about this state of devastation on the planet. Also as well, we found out that the judgment of the living will pass to that phase when the National Sunday Law commences when this when these powers that be when they fully come to fruition now in light of that again we are in revelation chapter 14 revelation chapter 14 we're going to read in verse 6 the bible says and i saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice fear god and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So again, we see here that the primary application of these two texts is primarily referring to the investigated judgment of the living. Now, in light of that, we're going to go to the preceding chapter in Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to read some things that pertain to this particular epoch in the world's history that is soon to commence. All right, Revelation chapter 13, we're going to start in verse 15. Now, again, we've already laid the foundation that the first beast of Revelation 13 represents the papacy, the Roman Catholic institution. And we found out that the second beast of Revelation 13, as described in verses 11 and, and the uh, succeeding uh, verses, is referring to the United States of America, particularly manifested in something called apostate Protestantism, or something called Christian nationalism, as we saw prior. So we're going to start in verse 15. It says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Now, we're not going to go through all of the idiosyncrasies again of what this image of the beast is, but we see that, at least in total, that it represents the United States and the religious element associated. All right, it says that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. 
And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. You see, again, we're going to fast forward a little bit, just to give you a little bit more information. The reason why Satan is going to seek to, to control the powers of this world so much to the point that no man will be able to buy or sell, the reason why he is doing this is because he knows that when this judgment passes to the cases of the living, he wants to ensure that no one will have the, as it were, practical ability to be able to serve God. You see, Satan is reasoning in his mind that if he can so can control the economic factors that pertain to daily living, that if he can so control these affairs, that no one will serve God simply for want of food, shelter, and clothing. And this is the real reason why Satan is going to bring this state of no buy and no sell upon the planet. Now, in light of that, we're actually going to turn to our screen and we see here a symbol of something called CBDC. Now, this CBDC stands for Central Bank Digital Currency. Now, again, we want to understand some of the idiosyncrasies of how Satan is going to bring this state of affairs upon the planet, especially from an economic standpoint. Notice. Okay, so this is a symbol of what the CBDC is. We see here at the bottom, it says centralized government trust, financial blockchain, currency, big data, and cost. This is essentially the powers that be on this planet are trying to create a state of digital affairs where paper money will com be completely obsolete, where the financial markets of the world will literally be able to be controlled simply from a computer. And just reasoning just naturally, if you're able to control the world's economy from a computer by default, if you are trying to ostracize someone, it will be very easy to push them out of the financial system. All right, so this is taken, This is an article from an outlet called the World Economic Forum. Now, the World Economic Forum is not a conspiracy theory outlet. This is a major world think tank. Notice, Central Bank Digital Currency Policymaker Toolkit. So they're actually about to explain to us what this CBDC system actually is. This says in recent years, central bank digital currency has risen to prominence as a policy and operational consideration for central banks. Ministries of finance and other institutions because of its potential to address both long-standing and new challenges such as financial inclusion and payment system stability. You see, it's very uh, even really satanic. In other words, what this is actually saying, unfortunately, very many times, the powers that are controlling the world, they will actually create a problem and then they will actually try to create a solution to the very problem that they themselves created. All right, continuing, this says for retail CBDC, a strong notice, a strong public engagement effort is imperative. Further, education and informational programs should be created so that users can understand the advantages and risks related to the CBDC. In other words, what, this, what they are saying in layman's terms is that they must create a system of propaganda to ensure that the common people are thoroughly deceived regarding the nature of this CBDC program. Now, for those of us who were able to watch some of our previous sessions, we found out that sadly, a vast majority of the world's media corporations are intentionally lying to those that are watching their programs. All right, we're going to continue. Okay, so this is taken from the IMF blog. This says more African central banks are exploring digital currencies especially here at home in Africa, they are really trying to make this CBDC program come into full fruition because Africa is actually the great storehouse of the vast majority of the world's natural resources. So, that, so they understand very intelligently, 
If they can get Africa on this system, they can greatly control the economic stability of the planet. All right, this says Nigeria was the second country after the Bahamas to roll out a CBDC. CBDCs are digital versions of cash that are more secure and less volatile than crypto assets because they are issued and regulated by central banks. All right, we're going to skip a little bit past this. All right, now this is a very powerful article from Forbes magazine. This says central bank digital currencies and freedom are incompatible. They do not have any proper congruence. All right, we're going to skip to the end of this article. Notice what this says. This says this level of government control is not compatible with economic or political freedom. Governments should foster more access to financial markets and ensure more innovation in financial services by supporting more private innovation and competition. They should reduce government monopoly and regulation and forego issuing retail CBDCs. So in this article from Forbes, they are arguing that if this system is inaugurated onto the planet, this is going to greatly destroy the economic freedom of every man, woman, boy and girl upon this planet. All right. Now, this is an article from Reuters. This is taken back in 2011. Now, we're going to try to bring this to a head. This says Vatican calls for global authority on the economy. Now, the reason why we're bringing this to view is that there is no geopolitical system that has called for a new economic world order more than the Vatican. There is no geopolitical system, not the United States, not the EU, not any of these uh, major uh, geopolitical bodies have called for this more than the Vatican City State. Now this says the Vatican called on Monday for the establishment of a global public authority and a central world bank to rule over financial institutions that have become outdated and often ineffective in dealing fairly with crises. Now again, Many of these crises that they're talking about are the very crises that they themselves created. And it's amazing that anytime we have these issues, they try to prompt themselves as the world's moral savior, not only the Vatican, but many of these geopolitical systems around the world. All right, we're going to skip past this. All right. Now, this is a gentleman by the name of Avril Manhattan. He's about to uh, reveal to us some of the idiosyncrasies of the Vatican's financial holdings. Notice. Now, remember, we're talking about the economic structure that Satan is going to seek to bring upon this planet in order to institute this time of trouble such as never was. This says, according to these estimates, the Holy See owned between 15 and 20 percent of the total stocks quoted on the Italian stock exchange. That's a lot. We're going to skip past this a little bit. This says the Holy See, in fact, besides being an important shareholder in what now is known as the Bank of America, had invested additional millions with sun-dry corporations. To quote only two, the American Anaconda Copper Company and the Sinclair Oil Company. This says Goodyear Tire and Rubber Firestone Fix. So this talks about all of the companies that the Vatican has stock holdings in. Now, this is a very startling statement. Notice this. The Catholic Church uh, would, by the close of the present century, own, control, and have a say, directly or indirectly, in at least one-third of all the sources of wealth of the Western world. Now, for those who do not know, all of the accumulated wealth in the world roughly estimates to about $450 trillion dollars yes trillion with the t 450 trillion dollars so this is saying that the vatican if they were to control one third of this this means that the vatican would have a say directly or indirectly in about 150 trillion dollars worth of the world's wealth i mean that is literally insane this says the prospect would be a frightening one as a mere abstraction. So I believe as a result of these quotations, 
that we have been able to see, at least in some detail, the economic system and structure that Satan is going to seek to bring upon this planet. Now, in light of that, as we go back to our screen, we have a symbol here of something called slavery. Now, remember, we're talking about the economic system that Satan is going to seek to bring upon this planet. Now, the reason why we're bringing out this issue of slavery is because we're going to see that the driving force behind slavery, especially the slavery of black Africans, it wasn't merely skin color, but it was primarily based upon economics. And the same economic system that was the driving force behind slavery is the same system that Satan is going to seek to inaugurate upon this planet. And this time, the slavery is not merely just going to be upon black persons, but any person that seeks to go against the powers that be, whether black, white, Asian, Hispanic, whatever the case may be. All right, now on our screen, we here have a symbol of Pope Francis kissing the hand of an indigenous woman in the country of Canada. Now let's see why he was doing this. This says the Pope's apology to indigenous people doesn't go far enough, Canada says. You see, Canada had a very bloody history, uh, not Canada, but uh, the Vatican rather, had a very bloody history in the country of Canada. Uh, many times the Vatican, along with their priests and their nuns, they would actually create schools and they would forcefully take indigenous children from their parents, forcefully re-educate them into Western society so that they wouldn't be savages and they would also greatly molest these little children. This is the Canadian government made clear Wednesday that Pope Francis's apology to indigenous peoples for abuses in the country's church one residential schools didn't go far enough. And again, we want to emphasize that the sources that we are quoting from are not conspiratorial in nature. This is from NPR, a very major outlet in the United States. All right, we're going to skip past this. Now, there's a reason why we're bringing up the nature of indigenous persons and their abuses under the papacy. Notice on our screen, we have a gentleman by the name who called himself Pope Alexander VI. Next, we have a man on the screen who went by the name of Christopher Columbus. And as we're going to find out, contrary to popular opinion, Christopher Columbus was not spreading Christianity to the so-called New World. The only thing that he was spreading was Catholic economic imperialism. That's all he was doing. All right, this says, taken from the Telegraph, on this day in 1493, a papal bull divides the world into two between Spain and Portugal. And the Bible actually prophesied about this in Daniel chapter 11, where it said that he would divide the land for gain. It was called the Pope's line. All right. This says in 1492, Christopher Columbus headed across the Atlantic on his first voyage. His patrons, King Ferdinand and, Is and Queen Isabella of Spain, were overjoyed at his reports of tropical paradises. All right, we're going to skip past this. Now, this is taken from a very, very powerful book called Slavery and Catholicism. Notice this. A Spanish Pope Alexander VI gave the title of Catholic by eminence to the sovereigns. It was those Catholic kings who first united reconquered Spain under their scepter. It says to maintain the purity of the Catholic faith in their realms. At the very bottom, it says, uh, and this encyclopedia could just as well have continued by saying that this discovery of America and conquest of Africa combined to write one of the blackest pages in the history of mankind. Sadly, what was, inaugura what was inaugurated by Pope Alexander VI and Queen Isabella uh, uh, of Spain and King Ferdinand, this, is what, this was one of the most darkest epochs in the world's history. And again, all of this was primarily for the sake of money, for the sake of money. All right, this says, um, it says a quotation. We're jumping down to the bottom. It says, a quotation from Columbus's own journal will show how paramount in the mind of Columbus 
was the matter of slavery and the financial gain from the slave trade. All right, we're going to skip past. On our screen, we have a gentleman by the name of Eric Williams. This man was the first prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, and he wrote a very powerful book called Slavery and Capitalism or Capitalism and Slavery. Notice what he says in his volume. When in 1492, 1492, Columbus representing the Spanish monarchy discovered the new world, he sent and trained the long and bitter international rivalry over colonial possessions. This says Portugal, which had initiated the movement of international expansion, claimed the new territories on the ground that they fell within the scope of a papal bull of 1455. At the bottom, it talks about the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Treaty of Tordesillas. Notice, neither the papal arbitration nor the formal treaty was intended to be binding on other powers, but both were in fact repudiated. Cabot's voyage to North America in 1497 was England's immediate reply to the partition. So just to clarify, it wasn't just Spain and Portugal that were engaging in this imperialism. England also wanted to get in on the affair. And so at the bottom it says, England, France, and even Holland began to challenge the Iberian Axis and claim the place, their place in the sun. The Negro, too, was to have his place, though he did not ask for it. All right. Now, notice this. The immediate successor of the Indian, however, was not the Negro, but the poor white. So what Eric Williams is here communicating, that after those imperialists came to the New World and started to massively enslave the Native Americans and butcher and kill them, as they started to greatly decrease that population, the immediate successor of the uh, Native American was not the black African, but it was actually the poor white, the indentured servant. We're actually going to find out that it wasn't just Native Americans and black Africans that were put into servitude. It was also actually many whites that were, that were brought over from Europe that were actually nothing more than glorified slaves. Notice. These white servants included a variety of types. Some were indentured servants, so-called, because before departure from the homeland, they had signed a contract intended by law, binding them to service for a stipulated time in return for their passage. Notice, again, on our screen is a symbol of this indentured servitude, this dear uh, white sister getting beaten for, for the fact that she wasn't, quote-unquote, doing her job. All right, now these two gentlemen wrote a very powerful book called White Cargo. Notice what they say. Notice. This book tells the story of these victims of empire, especially the British Empire. They were all supposed to gain their freedom eventually. For many, uh, it didn't work out that way. In the early decades, half of them died in bondage. This book tracks the evolution of the system in which tens of thousands of whites were held as chattels, marketed like cattle and punished brutally, and in some cases literally worked to death. Notice this. For decades, this underclass was treated just as savagely as black slaves and indeed toiled, suffered, and rebelled alongside them. So before this, this, this great racial division was brought into the mainstream, these white indentured servants and the enslaved black Africans, they would actually fight together in order to um, combat the oppression that was being heaped upon them. But notice, this says, according to contemporaries, some whites were treated with less humanity than the blacks working alongside them. Among the first to be sent the, uh, were, were children. Some were dispatched by impoverished parents seeking a better life for them but others were forcibly uh, deported. And it says in 1618, the authorities in London began to sweep up hundreds of troublesome urchins from the slums and ignoring protests. All right, skipping past. Now, this is a dear gentleman, a very prominent historian in the uh, Caribbean islands. Notice, notice what this man says. His last name was Hillary. 
This says the important structures, labor ideologies, and social relations necessary for slavery already had been established within indentured servitude. White servitude in many ways came remarkably close to the ideal type of chattel slavery. So they practiced these principles on the white indentured servants and perfected it with the black African. This says, which later became associated with the African experience. Notice this, as we continue. Now this is another author who wrote a very powerful book called The Invention of the White Race. Notice what he says. The invention of the white race, the truly peculiar institution, as the solution notice to the problem of social control. So this ideology of racial factions and all of this, this was actually created by the powers that be in order to inaugurate more social control. It says its failure in the West Indies, its establishment in the continental plantation colonies, signaled by the enactment of the act concerning servant and slaves, notice, which formally instituted the system of privileges for European Americans. It says uh, at the bottom, the remolding of male supremacy as white male supremacy, the peculiar American form of male supremacy as an essential element of the system of white skin privileges. So what was happening as a result of these white indentured servants and the black slaves fighting with, uh, fighting, uh, with each other in order to uh, fight against those that were oppressing them, they instituted these means of social control in order to keep the races separate. Because as a result of more contention between the races, it would help to produce more economic profit because it would always ensure that the black African or the Negro would be at the very bottom of the totem pole. Now remember, the reason why we're going over all of this is because this same system of economics that Satan inculcated during the time of slavery is the exact same system that Satan is about to inaugurate in this day and age. All right, this is a gentleman by the name of Roger Morneau. He wrote a very powerful book called A Trip into the Supernatural. He was an occult convert to seven-day Adventism. Notice, notice this, very powerful statement. This says, several times I have used the term friendly spirits. Perhaps I should explain it further. The, highest, uh, the high priest of the spirit group made it quite clear that Satan's armies and spirits are well regimented. The priest stated that fallen angels fall into three distinct groups. Now we're going to jump down to the middle here. It says the warriors, this is another group of demons. He said, concentrate on sowing discord in families and misunderstanding between friends, relatives, and neighbors. Such spirits love to create friction between races. So it is a directly demonic force that sows discord between the races. All right, we're gonna skip past this. Now again, this is just a symbol of the US dollar, the love of money, which is the root of all evil. Again, Eric Williams, notice what he says. Here then is the origin of Negro slavery. The reason was economic, not racial. It had to do not with the color of the laborer, but with the cheapness of the labor. As compared with Indian and white labor, Negro slavery was eminently superior. Notice why. In each case, writes Bassett discussing North Carolina, it was a survival of the fittest. Both Indian slavery and white servitude were to go down before the black man's superior endurance, docility, and labor capacity. So because the colonial powers perceived that the, black, uh, that the black race was capable of more labor, this is the reason why Negro slavery became the most predominant. This says, the features of the man, his hair, color, and uh, dentrifice, his subhuman characteristics so widely pleaded, were only the later rationalization to justify a simple economic fact, that the colonies needed labor 
and, res and restore to Negro labor because it was cheapest and best. So slavery was initially about economics, but racism was used in order to justify the degradation of a whole class of human beings. Because this is the principle intellectually. In order for, another hu for a human being to degrade another human being, you must first not see them as human. So if you see them like an animal or as being subhuman, it's much more easier to degrade them and to sleep peacefully with a clear conscience. At least that's what they thought. All right, now we're coming down to a, a close as it pertains to this economic system. Now on our screen, we have a, sim a symbol of something called feudalism. A symbol of something called feudalism. Now feudalism was the economic system that was inaugurated during the dark and middle ages in which the papacy, the Vatican, was at the head of this economic system. Now notice what this says. This is a symbol of the feudal pyramid of power. Now you see at the bottom you have merchants, farmers, craftsmen, that's the common people, that's us. Then you have the knights, then you have the nobility, then you have the monarch, and at the very tippy top, you have the Pope and the Vatican. This is the same economic system that Satan is trying to inaugurate in this here day and age. All right, on our screen, we have a man by the name of James Bryce. He wrote a very powerful book called The Holy Roman Empire. Notice what he says in this historical volume. Politically, it feudalism might be defined as the system which made the owner of a piece of land, whether large or small, the governor of those who dwelt thereon. You see, Sa Satan literally wants to own the entire world and have us all as slaves upon this planet. This says, on this principle were founded by it are explained feudal law, justice, feudal finance, and feudal legislation. All right, now we're going to skip past. This is taken from the Daily Beast just back in 2020. This says the coronavirus is also spreading a dark new era of neo-feudalism. So these tech companies are going to be one of the great mechanisms that Satan uses in order to re-inaugurate this system of feudalism. All right, we're going to skip past this. This says the Roman church state divides much of the theory on which 20th century, uh, on which secular 20th century totalitarian regimes have been based, as well as acting as a model for them. The practices and policies we associate with secular totalitarianism, thought control, coerced adherence to the party line, domestic espionage, denunciation by friends, family and acquaintances, midnight arrests, secret prisons, secret police, secret trials, forfeiture of property. Notice what it says at the bottom. These are also the things that have characterized the theory and practice of the Roman church state for centuries. So again, if the papacy is the one that inaugurated these things, who do you think are the ones that are currently controlling these very same systems? Now, in light of that, as we see here on our screen, this is a symbol of something called the fall of man. The fall of man. Now, in light of that, we're going to turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. We're going to turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Actually, you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Hold your finger there. But before we go to Genesis chapter 3, we're actually going to go back to Revelation chapter 13. Because we're actually going to go over one of the main driving forces, if not the main driving force, that Satan is going to use here in these last days, even above the realm of economics. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to start in verse 13. Notice what this says about the second beast, the United States. It says, And he doeth wonders, great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth, make a note of that deceiving, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword 
and did live. So in other words, what the Bible is saying that even above economics, that principally Satan is going to use the means of spiritualism in order to garner a large harvest of souls here in these last days. Now, in light of that, let's turn to Genesis three in verse. Let's turn to Genesis three and we will start in verse one, Genesis chapter three. And we're going to start in verse one. We're going to see something entitled the fall of man. Genesis chapter three. And let's notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter three. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, have God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. You see, all that spiritualism is, is the belief that you can live in sin and still have eternal life. That's, that is what spiritualism is. It's not merely practicing necromancy. It's not merely practicing witchcraft. At its root, spiritualism is merely the belief that you can live in open sin and still have eternal life. This is why the Bible tells us uh, when we read in our first Samuel, this is why the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. At the end of the day, if we are not being obedient to God, we are practicing witchcraft. All right, now let's notice this as we go back to our screen. This says the only one who promised Adam life and disobedience was the great deceiver. The, and the declaration of the serpent to Eve in Eden, ye shall not surely die, was the first sermon ever preached upon the immortality of the soul. The immortality of the soul, as we'll see, is one of the great fundamental principles of false and pagan education. This says, yet this declaration resting solely upon the authority of Satan is echoed from the pulpits of Christendom and is received by the majority of mankind as readily as it was received by our first parents. Now on our screen, we have a symbol of something called the Tower of Babel. Now we can read about the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 10, and we will actually turn to that. Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 10, and we are going to start in verse 7. Genesis chapter 10, actually we'll start in verse uh, 6, uh, just for the sake of context. Genesis 10 in verse 6, it says, And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizarim, and Phut, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba and Havilah, and Sabta and Rama and Sabteca, and the sons of Rama, Sheba and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. It says that he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. So what the Bible is actually saying is that Nimrod was not only a mighty hunter before the Lord, but he was a mighty hunter against the Lord. Notice this as we go back to our screen. This is actually the quotation we're actually about to read right now is actually taken from a Freemasonic source. Notice this. Who was Nimrod? The answer is he was the son of Cush in the old constitutions referred to as one of the founders of masonry. Now, this quotation is not saying that what we know today as Freemasonry, as far as the, the, the title or name of it, was started during the time of Nimrod, but the principles that Freemasonry practices was started by Nimrod. It says in the York Manuscript, we find at the making of the Tower of Babel, there was Masonry first much esteemed, and Nimrod was a Mason himself and loved well, Masons. Now, again, this is another Masonic source. Notice this. As regards Masonry, Babel, of course, represented a Masonic enterprise. At the very bottom, it says the ancient practice of Masons conversing without the use of speech. 
So Satan reasoned that if God was going to confuse the languages, that he was going to create a language in which God would not be able to confuse. I mean, it is literally blasphemy. It's insane. All right, we're skipping past. This is, the, this is a symbol of the kingdom of Babylon. Now remember, we're talking about the nature of spiritual, spiritualism and how Satan is going to use this mechanism in order to deceive a vast host of the world's population. Notice, this is from a particular outlet called Babylonian Life and History. That was the author before. It says, among the Babylonians, the belief in the immortality of the soul was fundamental. So again, this belief that the soul or that human beings are naturally immortal was a fundamental teaching of the city or the uh, nation of Babylon. All right, here we have a symbol of the nation of Egypt. This is the 4th century BC historian Herodotus. Notice what he says about Egypt. The Egyptians were also the first people to put forward the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Again, we see the historical context. Now on our screen, we have a symbol of a man by the name of Plato. We are about to find out that the whole world's current philosophy is based upon the writings and teachings of the philosopher Plato. And that is not a good thing. Notice. Plato journeyed to Egypt, where from Pisunius, we also gather that it was the Egyptians that Plato learned the mystery of the immortality of the soul. And again, we're going to find out that this spiritualistic teaching of the natural immortality of the soul ran through all of Plato's teachings. Notice. Now, this is E.A. Sutherland, one of the greatest educational minds ever given to Seventh-day Adventism. Notice, in order to understand the fertility and the seeds of pagan education, it is necessary to regard with care the mastermind of that system, and, and this we find in Plato. Now again, this is another um, historian by the name of Painter. Notice what he says. Plato is philosophy and philosophy Plato. Now this is a very powerful quotation. Notice, in the middle, how many, how many great men nature is incessantly sending up out of night to be his men, Platonists. Mahometanism or Islam draws all its philosophy and its handbook of morals from him. So this is saying that the principles that pertain to the religion of Islam actually came from the doctrines of Plato. And it's the same thing with the Roman Catholic institution. As our Jewish Bible has implanted itself in the table talk and household life of every man, woman, and European American nations, so the writings of Plato have preoccupied the mind of every school of learning, every lover of thought, every church, and every poet, making it impossible to think on certain levels except through him. All right, we're going to skip past again, E.A. Sutherland. Notice at the very bottom. And thus from Plato, Europe and America have gained their ideas of evolution. So even the concept of Darwinian evolution finds its roots in the doctrines of Plato. Because the only thing evolution is, is the human mind trying to account for the mechanisms of the universe apart from the word of God. That's the only thing evolution is. All right, now this is A.T. Jones, a very powerful Seventh-day Adventist author. Notice what he says in a book called The Place of the Bible in Education. And what did this education, the literature, the art, the physical culture, all that it produced do for the Roman people when adopted by them? Deep died as was the iniquity of Rome. Greece and Rome perished so entirely that no part remained. Annihilation being the result of Greek education to both Greek and Roman. So in light of this, if we as Christians, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, adopt these teachings of Plato, whether in our churches, our schools, or even in our hospitals, if we do these things, the end result will be annihilation. And this is why we as Seventh-day Adventists were to have a completely different system of education for our young people. 
This is why so many of our Seventh-day Adventist young people go off to university and come back infidels and skeptics. All right, on our screen, we have a symbol of spiritualism. We have a symbol of spiritualism again. Manly Palmer Hall, we're going to try to go through this before we close. The mysteries were therefore established for the purpose of unfolding the nature of man according to certain fixed rules, which when faithfully followed, elevated the human consciousness. Notice, the most dangerous form of black magic is the scientific perversion of occult power for the gratification of personal desire. Its less complex and more universal form is human selfishness. And this is amazing because this is coming from a Freemason. And this Freemason is even declaring that when we practice selfishness, that we're actually engaging in black magic. I mean, that is incredible. All right, this is Alice A. Bailey, one of the great occult writers of the 20th century. Notice what she says. This is so satanic. There is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time. So this woman is literally saying that one of the greatest needs of this generation is for the vast majority of the world's population to become very familiar with the occult. And we see this very prevalent today in the movies, it's in the sports, it's in everything. All right, this says the new age is upon us in which man will begin to use his divine power. This is so satanic and come into closer touch with the spiritual forces of all life. The work of the new religion will be the distribution of spiritual energy. All right. Now, this is a man by the name of David Spangler. This is so satanic. Again, notice this. Lucifer prepares man in all ways for the experience of Christhood. Lord have mercy. But the light that reveals to us the presence of Christ, the light that reveals to us the path to the Christ, comes from Lucifer. He is the light giver. He is aptly named the morning star. You see, these occultists believe that when Adam and Eve sinned, that, that, that this actually inaugurated a new system of intellectual greatness and that it was actually a good thing that Adam and Eve sinned. All right, now on our screen, we have a symbol of a particular person. Now I know that many of us looking at this picture will automatically say that this is Jesus, but this is actually not a symbol of Jesus. This is a symbol or a picture of Satan. You see, we are told in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, especially in the great controversy, that very soon Satan will personate Christ, not impersonate, but that he will personate. Notice what Alice A. Bailey says about this personation. Now remember, we're talking about spiritualism. She says, forgetting the things that lie behind, I will strive towards my higher spiritual possibilities. I dedicate myself anew to the service of the coming one, and I can promise you she's not talking about Jesus Christ. And will do all I can to prepare men's minds and hearts for that event. I have no other life intention. You know, when I read these things, it makes me very sad. Because when I see the fervent devotion that these occultists give to Satan, it literally makes me cry when I look at my own life. When I look at us generally as Christians, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, and see how sleep we are, but Satan's agents are so fervent about their mission. This says the major required preparation is a world at peace. The major effect of his appearance will surely be to demonstrate in every land the effects of a spirit of inclusiveness. All right. On our screen is a symbol of the United Nations. I know that we're rushing a little bit. Now, some people may think that the United Nations was created in order to bring political and economic stability to the planet, but that was not the reason why this organization came into being. On the screen is a gentleman by the name of Robert Mueller. This is the former Undersecretary General of the United Nations. Notice what the man says. 
the world's major religions in the end all want the same thing. Now, that's actually completely false. Even though they were born in different places and circumstances on this planet, worldwide spiritual ecumenism would be probably the closest uh, to the heart of the resurrected Christ. Notice what Robert Miller goes on to say. No human force will ever be able to destroy the United Nations is not a mere building or a mere idea. It is not a man-made creation. So again, this is the question. If the United Nations was not man-made, then who made it? And again, Robert Miller was not a conspiracy theorist. This man held a very prominent position in the United Nations. Notice. The United Nations is the vision light of the absolute supreme in the occult. That is the name that they give for Satan, which is slowly, steadily and unerringly and unerringly illuminating the ignorance. The divine success and supreme progress of the United Nations is bound to become a reality. Notice at his choice hour, speaking of Satan, the absolute supreme will bring will ring his own victory bell here on earth through the loving and serving heart of the United Nations. So though it may have seemed initially that the United Nations was created to bring economic and political stability, its main aim was to prepare the world for when Satan personates Christ. This is literally insane. All right, we're bringing this message to a close. This is a symbol of the Vatican. Uh, this quotation from this very powerful volume just talks about how the Vatican is also preparing for the coming of Satan. All right, actually, we won't read this just for the sake of time. This says, by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will fully disconnect herself from righteousness at the bottom. Then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. All right, now on our screen again, we have a symbol of death. We have a symbol of spiritualism. This just talks about all of the different mechanisms that we see this in. This talks about sports. It's in the fashion. Again, we're not going to go over this for the sake of time. I mean, look at this article. This is how superstition and clairvoyance influence fashion designers from Christian Dior to Coco Chanel. I mean, amazing. We're going to skip past this. Now we're going to end on this very last point. Now, do you think that spiritualism has even come into the church? Yes. Notice this. Now on our screen is a symbol of something called voodoo. Notice this possessed voodoo's origins and influence from blues to Brittany. We're actually going to find out that in very many of our popular churches, that voodoo is being actively practiced. Notice. Blissed out ecstatic union with our divine selves, we seek it at raves and rock concerts and in the desert with the burning man. I try to get there when I'm jamming with my band, but I didn't realize until I wrote. It says how much this longing relates to West African spirituality. In the middle, voodoo is a neo-African religion that evolved in the new world from the 6,000 year old West African religion of Udan. This was the religion of many slaves brought from West Africa to the Americas. It says the, at the bottom, the roots of rock are in a West African word for dance, rock. As Michael Ventura wrote in his important essay, Hear That Long Snake Moan. At the top, the voodoo rite of possession by the God became the standard of American performance in rock and roll. Notice Elvis Presley, Little Richard. Jerry Lee Lewis, James Brown, Janis Joplin, Tina Turner, Jim Morrison, Johnny Rotten and Prince. It doesn't matter what genre of music it is, whether it's rock and roll, jazz, hip hop, R&B, they have all of their roots in voodoo. Now, again, the question is, what does this have to do with the church? Notice in the middle. Voodoo possession is not the hokey demon possession of zombie movies. It's a state notice of union with the divine achieved through drumming. Notice dancing and singing. It's becoming filled with the Holy Ghost 
in the Pentecostal Christian tradition. You see, many times when persons in Christian settings and all the music comes in with the drumming and all these things, and persons perceive that the Holy Spirit is coming into the dwelling, this is not the Holy Spirit, but it is another spirit. Notice, in the Yoruba culture of West Africa, being able to connect with one's inner divinity is called coolness. You see, this is the reason why we have to be very careful with the slang that we use. Many times we do not understand its origins. Again, notice, this says Thomas A. Dorsey, gospel pioneer. Thomas Dorsey is considered as the godfather of modern gospel music. Now we're going to see how this meshes with the church. Notice, Thomas Dorsey, widely acknowledged as the father of gospel music, died Saturday night in his Chicago home. This says, as a blues piano player in Chicago in the 1930s, Mr. Dorsey first wove together blues and jazz musical styles and the text of traditional spirituals and called the new sound gospel. Notice, some people considered that sacrilegious at the time. So all of the gospel music that we think that is just mainstream from all of these artists like Kirk Franklin and, 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 and all the rest of them, you can name all of them, Many times we have no thought when we listen to these things, but in the past, Christians perceived this as being sacrilegious. Notice, because of Mr. Dorsey's influence as a songwriter, music publisher and performer, Chicago became and has remained the gospel capital of the world. And I'll actually just give a very short testimony before we close. In my former days, I actually used to be a drummer. And especially in the music scene, when you're a musician, music is literally your life. Now remember, this was in the context of me being a Seventh-day Adventist. And so back in the day when I was a drummer, I remember sometimes we would have something called shed sessions, where musicians, we would just come together and, and play and, and, and rock, as we called it. And so we came um, one night, it was a Thursday, and I remember this so vividly, we came for a shed session, and there was a couple drummers, myself, and there was uh, some bassists and, and pianists. And uh, before all of the musicians came, there was a drummer, uh, myself, and one of the uh, brothers, he got on the drums and I got on the organ. At the time, I could play some little grooves or whatever may have you. And so I got on the organ and started playing a jazz groove that I made at home. Now, as I started to play this groove, the brother who was playing the drums, I mean, he was killing the drums. And in past terms, that word killing, that's actually a good connotation. So in the past, this brother, he was killing the drums. And as we started to play about 20 minutes into the, to the session, and mind you, to my mind at the time, it sounded amazing. And so about 20 minutes into the session, I felt such a strong spirit come into the sanctuary. Now, mind you, as a result of playing at church and at concerts and all these things, I thought that the spirit that I was feeling so strongly was the Holy Spirit. But mind you, we were not playing a gospel song. We were not playing anything spiritual. We were playing a jazz groove that I had made, but I perceived that it was the Holy Spirit. Just as uh, Saul, King Saul, perceived that he saw the prophet Samuel at the Witch of Endor. And so as a result of this, when this spirit came in, I said that we need to stop and pray because the Holy Spirit is in this place. But as the years went on and I started to understand the idiosyncrasies of these musics, I started to realize in actuality that I was helping to encourage and to conjure up demons in the sanctuary. And again, for some of us listening, we might have never heard these things before, but this is the sad reality of the deception that Satan is bringing into our midst, especially us as Seventh-day Adventists. And it's so sad, especially for many of us as black persons, we will say, well, this is how we express ourselves. This is how we get in tune with the Holy Spirit. But brothers and sisters, though music is critically important, the Bible tells us very clearly in John chapter 4 that above music that we must worship God in spirit but also in truth. So though we may perceive that we have a spirit, if it's not in truth, then it's not the Holy Spirit. 
And so, brothers and sisters, as we bring this message to a close, I pray that by God's grace, we have seen, at least in some detail, how Satan is going to use economics and how he is going to use spiritualism in order to inaugurate this time of trouble such as never was. And my appeal is very, very simple. Brothers and sisters, we have a large amount of work to do to be prepared properly for these last days. There are going to be things that we're going to have to put away, where there's going to be music, where there's going to be articles of food, as we'll find out later in our sessions. Brothers and sisters, if we are going to be found hid in Christ, then we must be obedient to every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Jehovah. And with that, we will close and have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, there is so much that could have been communicated, but I believe that at least to some degree a foundation has been given. Lord, you do not reveal things to us because you are desiring us to be scared or because you are trying to condemn us, but you are seeking merely to enlighten us, to educate our conscience so that we can make better decisions as it pertains to you and as it pertains to eternity. We pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to come up higher in our Christian experience. And I just pray that you may be with us until we come together for our next session. In Jesus' name, amen.